Hello and welcome to the Joe's Art History Podcast, a podcast which celebrates all things art historical every single day. On today's podcast, I have invited back Scottish illustrator Nicole McLaughlin, aka Nicole Paws, to do something a little different on today's show. We sit down and we discuss one art historical beef, aka a disagreement, one art world controversy, and one art world conspiracy theory, which we've each found and discussed to the other one for the first time. This was a really interesting episode and I think it just kind of shows you the breadth of which art history can stretch and uh, a particular highlight of mine is the conspiracy theories of art history. Before we get started, I would just like to say, uh, once again, the audio in this isn't particularly loud unfortunately and um, Nicole and I did record this in the same room however I think something was wrong with her mic and that uh, she seems to be she seems very far away so I do apologize again however this does not take away from all the interesting things that we discussed throughout this episode so sit back relax and let Nicole and I entertain you with some art history beefs controversies and conspiracy theories within the art world Okay, so today, Nicole, you're coming at me with, we've got a a little bit of a different setup today. So we're going to be discussing an art history beef, aka a disagreement. Yes. An art history controversy. So something within the art world that's happened that sparked a little bit of debate Mm -hmm. and attention. And finally, probably my most exciting, an art historical conspiracy theory, because you have to love a conspiracy theory. And some of them are just hilarious. Okay, so Nicole, you're going to kick us off today and you're coming at me with quite a contemporary art historical beef. (laughs) Yes, I think this is what, I guess, started this kind of conversation was when I told you about this. Yeah. Um, So it's between Stuart Semple and Anish Kapoor. Mm -hmm. So Stuart Semple is a British artist. He works in various ways, like painting, sculpture and collage. All his work is used for activism and he discusses his mental health journey, his fears and challenges through social class issues such as consumerism, he's an advocate for mental health and he's even an ambassador for Mind. Oh, right, the charity. Yeah. Oh, lovely. So his beef is with Anish Kapoor, as I mentioned. Kapoor is a British Indian sculptor known for making massive pieces such as like the bean and then one that you've posted before, that big, the farm, is it? Yeah, it's a farm in... um... Museum. I think it's called Dismemberment or something like that. Yeah, can't I've got it offhand. But the bean for anyone listening is uh, the Chicago bean. So, or it's also called Cloudgate. Oh, it's that amazing sort of silver, very reflective, hot spot selfie taking um, sculpture. So he's very famous for making kind of structures that will stay where they are, just big massive pieces. But he's also known for buying the rights for using Venta Black. Okay. So. What is Venta Black? Venta Black, thank you for asking, is a synthetic material that absorbs 99.96% of light and radiation that hits its surface. Okay. So the best way I could describe it is, do you know the Roadrunner when he puts down that black hole and it becomes a, a hole to fall into? Yeah. It looks like that. So it looks really cartoonish, really flat, and it's the closest thing we'll ever be able to see to what a black hole actually looks like. Oh, really? Yeah. So, Anish Kapoor used this material for a bunch of his work because he's obsessed with the void. But you have to have an engineer apply it to the work. He can't actually use it. Oh. So he has obviously the money behind him. Okay. Well, can I can I ask, sorry, why that is he needs an engineer? Just just the way the material works. Oh, it has it to the... be manipulated in a certain way. Oh, the, the chemicals only... and stuff. Yeah. Oh, so, Okay. So that's the only way he could use it. So to be honest, he didn't. He did buy the rights, but it's just he could afford to do it. Mm-hmm. And the engineers behind the material were just like, it was the kind of good opportunity to use it. Yeah. Because it was a good way to get it out there. But people were not happy that he owned the rights to this colour or to the Vendor Black. Right, okay. Because I believe it's like £10,000. I've seen that number thrown about, but... I. When I was looking again, I couldn't find the numbers. So okay, so it, this was like exclusive. He's bought the exclusive rights. Right, to okay. use this colour. Mm-hmm. So 
This is where Stuart Semple comes in. So Semple refers to Anish Kapoor as the supervillain of the art world. Right. So he, in protest, decided to make The Pink is Pink. And he already has a website where he sold pigments. It's called Culture Hustle. Okay. But when he'd heard about... I guess it was a kind of stir with everyone. Mm -hmm. Anish Kapoor owning a certain colour. It was really unheard of. I think there's only one other artist who's done it. And it was with a shade of blue that they used a lot. Oh, um, Eve Klein. So this is his um, international blue. And um, he was an artist. Again, just exactly what you said. He's known for this very deep royal blue mm. and he uses it within all his works but not just in sort of paint form also in its pure pigment as well because mm. his whole idea of using it was to like break it free from its traditional constructs of or confinement rather of line right so can't believe people think art history is uh <laughs> wankery can't believe it <laughs> <laughs> no, I wonder why. can't believe people think art history is stuck up <laughs> <laughs> so um, the guidelines of the pink is pink okay. is that Anish Kapoor cannot use it. So if you go on to Culture Hustle's website, if you buy any of the range, which is called the coloriest colour, which I think is amazing, it says, and I quote, note, by adding this product to your cart, you can confirm that you are not Anish Kapoor, you are not in no way affiliated to Anish Kapoor, you are not purchasing this item on behalf of Anish Kapoor, or associated with Ganesh Kapoor, to the best of your knowledge, information and belief, this paint will not make its way into the hands of Ganesh Kapoor, hashtag share the black. But Ganesh Kapoor sadly did get his hands on the pinkest pink, but I couldn't see where it went, but Semple did say that he was going to have a lawsuit about it because the agreement is he should not have got the pinkest pink. But to challenge the Vinta black, he has then made the blackest black, black 2.0, and in 2019 made black 3.0, which reflects 99% of reflection and radiation. So essentially it's on par now with Ventablack. Right, okay. So you can buy the bottle, it's 150 mils and it's 14.99. Okay. So it means that he's opened it up to everyone to be able to use and he's always wanted everyone to be able to use the colours that he makes, except Anish Kapoor. Okay, but there's this thing where Kapoor did get his hands on some, but is there like an ongoing like court battle or something with it? It's quite an interesting... Like beef. He only got his hands on the the pink. The pink. But there's other things where Anish Kapoor's kind of done something and then people have gone to Sample and asked for help and then Sample's done stuff to challenge it. So there was another one which I just know I don't have it all kind of sorted out, so I won't be able to get references and stuff, but there was he wanted to build an extension on where he stays in London, uh -huh. but then that would have blocked the light to people that lived near him. Yeah. So then they'd contacted Sample, and then Sample had made, created this reflective paint. Right. So that then they would have a better light source. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, so I said, I mean, the most amazing thing is he has made this amazing range of colours. Um, so it's a mixture between like pigments and actual paints and stuff like that. Yeah. But just the science behind it is amazing as well, because when he was talking about like 3.0, he had to do a Kickstarter because of the technique that was needed to make the paint. Oh really? So he got a whole load of like independent people yeah, like involved basically. in. Basically. Um it's amazing though. Like it's it's a really fun, interesting thing. And I actually think I'm gonna buy the black is black. Because when I was when I was kind of reading about even just Venta Black and they were saying like it's really cartoonish and he's done like well Anish Kapoor's done like that Venta Black on a circle mm -hmm. and it does just look like the Roadrunner just through a, a hole like do you know what I mean like through a black hole down and for some and some people have like fault like I think he's done ones where there are indents and then he paints it black so it looks like it's a continuous hole and people have fallen into it which is mental. But obviously it's not a pure continuous void. That's the end of my, well, the, the beef. And so it's an ongoing one. It's one that's not, never been sort of resolved. No, because there's we'll... even people who make fun of it with things like kiss the bean and paint the bean, the pink is pink. And yeah. Because I think there was stuff where he didn't want people taking pictures with the bean. Yeah, there was something, something, some nonsense about that. But yeah, it caused quite a sort of large sort of discussion and sort of controversy in the art world as well when he, when he bought the rights to this colour. Yeah, it's just very interesting anyone that thinks they can own the right to a colour exclusively yeah. for themselves. I think um, that's kind of really missing, in my opinion, what the point um, of art is. But anyway, what do we know? I'm sure there are um, reasons behind it and not being, you know, international superstar artists, I'm sure uh, we are, but 
mere observers. <laughs> to the drama. <laughs> to the drama. Just living it up. Okay, right. So my beef is very art historical, actually. And it's about one of art history's most famous Italian painters called Caravaggio. Now, Caravaggio was active in, well, throughout Italy for most of his life, but is best known for painting in Rome. And he is famed for his intense and unsettling paintings, mm -hmm. particularly of like biblical depictions. So you might know him as, th there's a really famous one of Medusa, where it's this, very, this round portrait on a green background, and it's just the decapitated head of Medusa. Also, anyone that's listening to the podcast, any images and paintings that are referenced, we will put up on Instagram. So you can find them on my Instagram or you can find them on my website and everything will be linked in the show notes below. Anyway, so the beef that I've got is that Caravaggio killed a man, which I had absolutely no idea about until we started sort of researching sort of like art historical beefs, which actually, if you Google, just brings up a whole lot of stuff about singers and songwriters now. <laughs> Katy Perry and Taylor Swift. Here we go, the biggest beef going, <laughs> although I think that's settled now. <laughs> anyway, Caravaggio, it's well documented that he was very hot-blooded and um, very, a very passionate and very aggressive uh, person. There's actually historical records from the police logs in Rome show that he was in trouble all the time. Oh so there's <laughs> logs of, um, in one of the accounts in 1604, he threw a plate of artichokes at a waiter's face and was arrested. Another police log has him in 1605 that he also attacked a guard, a Roman guard with stones and was imprisoned for a little while but got free. However, the beef that we're talking about um, happened in 1606 and his temper went a bit too far. He stabbed and killed a well-known Roman pimp named Ranuccio Tomassoni. And through that, obviously there was a price on his head and then he had to flee Rome and for the remaining years of his life was continuously on the run, sort of going from place to place, trying to wait out a, a papal pardon, which is basically he'd, a, he'd appealed to the Pope, pardon this murder. And the reason he was killed was not, when you think pimp, you think, well, maybe he, he owed some money or it was over a prostitute. It was over a game of tennis. <laughs> And basically, some money had been uh, had been put aside, and anyway, it didn't it didn't go in Caravaggio's favour, and his um his way of dealing with it was to, to kill the man to kill him. Yep, my man just killed a man. Oh, that's it. So he spent the the rest of his life on the run, sort of running around all over Italy, and ended up in Malta, Sicily, Naples. Um, however, this beef or this murder it's not really a beef it's a murder it's not really a beef it's a murder the, beef's, the beef caused a murder the beef caused a murder <laughs> so he spent the final years of his life moving between naples malta and sicily waiting for a, a papal pardon so that is when the pope of rome forgives you on behalf of god because at this time the pope and he still is today seen as the living embodiment of god on earth mm -hmm. However, this beef was long continuing because people were out for revenge and the family of the gentleman killed put a price on Caravaggio's head, which is why he continuously had to keep moving around so people didn't find him. So there's a whole controversy over his death. Now, some people say he was killed in revenge. Mm. Some people say that he annoyed knights when he was in Malta and it was the knights that killed him. And historians have said that he actually died of syphilis or maybe something like malaria. However, in 2010, his bones were found. And after extensive DNA and carbon dating and other analysis, it was identified that Caravaggio might have died from lead poisoning, oh. which was... Well, in part lead poisoning because paints used at his time contained high amounts of lead salts, which may also have linked Caravaggio to his sort of bouts of madness, of madness and um, spikes in his yeah. behaviour. So this is why they think perhaps he was a bit hot tempered because of this lead poisoning. However, later results show that there might also have been some sort of blunt trauma. 
Oh, so it's maybe just an amalgamation of all those uh, things. Of everything, yeah. But So they seem to think that there was maybe, um, it was maybe a gangster or a botch attempt to, to kill him. Oh, well, it's not it's not really botched if it worked though. Let's be honest. Um, <laughs> Successful assassination. Well, that's it. So there's, but there's still a complete conspiracy theory around how he died because mm. he died very young. He was only in his thirties when he died, um, and he was incredibly famous yeah. in Rome. He produces these incredible scenes that really affected people because of how realistic, but also how violent they were. Yeah. But yeah, that is. A beef that continued to to haunt him, um, but I think it's quite interesting that the idea of lead poisoning could have affected his mood and behaviour and contributed to that. Yeah, that is very interesting. Yeah, so there you are. That is that is the beefs. The beefs out the way. That's the beefs. <laughs> okay, as well as a beef, you have a controversy for yeah. me, Nicole. Yeah, baby. So my controversy is Gorilla Girls. Mm -hmm. So this is a group of anonymous female activists which began in New York in 1985. They wore, and I believe they're still active, so they wear gorilla masks and they create thought-provoking work to challenge sexism and racism within the art world. Mm, okay. Uh, so they use this with books, stickers, flyers, billboards, just kind of traditional means to protest and spread the message of the injustices. So the piece that I'm actually discussing is... Do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? And it was made in 1989. So this was a part of the Gorilla Girls Talk Back series. This was challenging the lack of female and people of colour within galleries, auctions and dealers. But this piece in particular was inspired by the Metropolitan Museum's collection in New York. They went to this exhibition and gathered the information themselves. So they went round and counted every artist that was participating in the muse within this exhibit that they had on. So the poster inclined um so the original one because they've updated it twice now okay because the issue's still there it is a yellow poster and it has an original kind of renaissance painting of a nude but the female has a gorilla mask on and it says do women have to be naked to get into the museum and then underneath it it says less than five percent of artists in the modern art section are women but 85% nudes are female. And then it's Gorilla Girls Conscious of the Art World. So this piece was inspired or created because the Public Art Fund in New York asked them to design a billboard. But then when they created it, the project rejected it because it said it didn't have a clear enough message. Right, and, and this was the what you're talking about. This is what they produced for because this billboard. This, yeah, so they were asked to create this billboard. Okay. Then they went to the Met, counted all the pieces gathered the statistics himself, made the poster, showed it to the fund, and then they said, no, the message isn't clear enough. Which, it's yellow and black! <laughs> it pops! <laughs> so, they then decided to just do it themselves. Right, okay. So they bought bus space mm -hmm. in New York, but then the bus company began pulling it down because it was they didn't know what was in the female's hand, and it was considered, con like, offensive. Okay. Is there anything in, in her hand? It's it looks like a fan or a duster. It doesn't look offensive, but the top looks, I guess you could argue if you were really want to do something, you could say phallic, but it doesn't. Right, okay. See, that's the only thing I could think. It's probably a fan, yeah. It looks like a fan, but the top is a thin handle with like a circle on the top. So if you're really pulling at straws, you could say phallic, but I, that's not what's there. But they pulled it down because it was offensive because of what was in her hand. Love that. Okay. And what happened so what happened after that? So they, they put it on the buses, the buses started tearing it down because they, it could potentially be seen as offensive. So they also then because it was a part of that series, mm -hmm. they did stickers, they what they would stick it on the museum doors. They made pamphlets, which they would go into museum shops. And st so whenever they would make something, it would be challenging a statistic or challenging the lack of female people of colour representation, okay. which I've said. Um, so it would be things like, you're only seeing half the picture of the art world, and then the poster. So they use graphics a lot, right? which is quite interesting. And it's it just really, like, they're just really beautifully designed. So the one that's you're only seeing half the art world is, it's like a A5 white card. Mm -hmm. And I would maybe say like 20% is where all that message is. Right, okay. So they use space to emphasise their message. It's very punchy, very hard hitting gets the message point clearly. So they would stick messages like that in books and gift shops. 
they would put leaflets in museums and stuff like that. They just did everything that they could to get their message out. They also green printed tote bags with gorilla faces and would hand them to people to wear okay. to join their protests, which I thought was quite a fun fact. But as I said earlier, they updated it twice. Okay. So they update so the original is 1989. 1989. Okay. So 2005 version is less than 3% of artists in the modern art section are women. But eighty three percent are nudes, which means it's gone down two percent. But now there's even less females. So originally it was five, and so it's I mean three. It's... Yeah, but then they have less nudes too, which is eighty three. <laughs> wow, guys, you're doing a great job. <laughs> um, so the two thousand and twelve one is less than four percent of artists in the modern art section are women, but seventy six of the nudes are female. So they've taken a lot of the nudity away. Well done, and they've upped. The representation by 1%. So girls, let's be happy. At least they've got done that for us, you know? And yeah, that's it. That's incredible. Do you know what? So I've heard of the Gorilla Girls, but I'll be really honest and say that it's impossible to know like everything about everyone in, in the art world. But there's somebody who, I, I mean, I was I was aware of this poster. Yeah. And I was aware of their message and their activism and what they're trying to do because they've also been active in London as well. I think they're active in more places than just the it's, States. It started in New York and now I believe it's a global movement. Yeah. Because they are obviously still creating stuff to this day. Like they've just released a book. Like they've released, I think, three books and stuff like okay. that. So, And obviously there is still an issue of lack of diversity of course there is of course there is of course and even recently so we're recording this this is we're recording this in september 2020 and there was a recent study done that of the 100 top artists currently working like are, are sort of worth purchasing yeah. in the art market only two of them are women two only two of the top 100 are women and something it's something like eighty five percent is nudes is is still the naked women. Naked women are still the sort of the theme. Main subject matter. Yeah, I mean, they're like I said, like they're they're a group I know of, but don't don't know a horrendous amount about actually. So maybe that would be quite a good podcast episode to do is kind of look at their their work like in that. a bit more detail. Yeah, no, absolutely, because it's an incredibly important message and something the art world still suffers from today: complete lack of female representation. But of course, there's lots of art historians, female art historians, sort of um, beating the drum for lack of representation um, within the art world. There's a great Instagram account called The Great Women Artists, if anyone is interested, or, you, I mean, fairly certain if you're listening to this, you're, you're a follower or keen on art history, so you may have come across it. If not, I would highly recommend that you that you follow that account. It gives you, every day it sort of posts a little something about a different female artist. And, yeah, yeah, so there you are. So, yeah. Give me your controversy. All right. Um, so mine is also quite a current one, and it's to do with the notorious contemporary artist Jeff Koons. Now, if you're listening and you don't know who Jeff Koons is, Jeff Koons is kind of the American answer to the British Damien Hirst. So he is, well, first of all, he's way more established than I would say that, than Damien is. He's been going a hell of a lot longer. But he's known for his representation and sort of poking fun at everyday life using sort of recognisable objects from the everydays. A lot of his work is based around balloon animals. So you might have seen big balloon dogs or big um, balloon rabbits with these like highly shiny surfaces. These, that this is Jeff Koons. Yeah, you either love him or you hate him. I I quite like him business-minded sort of sense. I didn't think anyone hated him. Jeff Koons? <laughs> Just because you know, he's balloon animals? No. Oh, there's like, he's got like a whole other like, back catalogue of like weird and wonderful things yeah and um he's actually a different controversy but he actually he replaced a lot of the a lot of the staff in his new york foundry and studio with machinery oh yikes so there was a whole thing about that um but that's not what i'm bringing to the table here so my controversy is that in 2016 jeff coons offered the city of paris a new sculpture to commemorate the terrorist attacks of 2015 and those who lost their lives, which was 131 Parisian citizens. And as a sign of Franco-American comradeship and alliance, Jeff approached the city in the January of 2016 and said, I would like to gift you a sculpture. The work is called A Bouquet of Tulips. 
And to describe the sculpture, it's this hyper-realistic hand holding 11 balloon tulips. Okay. Kind of like what you would if you went to a, a child's party and you made a, yeah. a balloon flower. Yeah. And there's, instead of, there's only 11 instead of 12 because the missing 12 flower in the bunch um, represents the fallen right. and those who lost their lives in the attacks. But there was a lot of controversy which surrounded the idea of him giving this sculpture to the city of Paris. So number one, he was just giving the idea. He wasn't giving the $4.5 million which it would cost the city to make and install. Oh my god. What? What? I know. It's bad. And he couldn't really understand why people were outraged by this. So it was the um, American um, chancellor who, who living in France, approached Coons and said, would you, do you think it'd be a good idea to make something? And he came up with this concept and gifted the idea to Paris. Uh, so that was, that was number one. And then he also wanted to put it into a square by a museum, which is all about French art, both contemporary and modern French art. And the whole idea of why that was a controversy was because the whole idea of that space is that it should be left open for temporary exhibitions as it has always been. And it's always it's normally a space for French artists, not an American artist. And this caused wide outcry because where he had suggested it was installed, it would essentially render the gallery underneath it completely useless because of how much they would need to sort of reinforce, because it's something like 30-odd tonnes, and they would need to reinforce the gallery, so there was, an, there was a chance that it would render the gallery completely useless. So a lot of people that worked in the art world kind of tagged it as a publicity stunt and like a product placement for Coons and his artwork. So basically from the second it was announced, it was filled with controversy, there was a, and there was a petition within a few hours that got 8,000 signatures saying, do not install this. But the issue was, it wasn't the idea, they liked the idea of it, but it was all the things that kind of, came with the it. conditions that came with it. And the Professional Committee of Art Galleries in Paris released this statement, which says, The Professional Committee of Art Galleries wish to make it known its opposition to the permanent installation of the Jeff Kuhn sculpture, Bouquet for Tulips, between the Museum of Modern Art and the City of Paris and the Palace de Tokyo. This is not a matter of judging aesthetic qualities or the suitability of the sculpture as a homage to the victims of the attacks in France, but the location that was chosen. While it is important to pay tribute to the artist for his generosity and attention to the victims of terrorism, it is also important that the commemoration of a dramatic event finds its place in an appropriate and specific context outside of any location related to artistic manifestations that could weaken or distract from the memory. It is the duty of the city of Paris to make such a site in collaboration with all the people concerned, as well as the artist. We believe that the immediate surroundings of the Museum of Modern Art for the city of Paris and the Palace de Tokyo, much like those of the Georges Pompidou Centre, must remain free for those institutions to programme depending on current events and should not be subjective to definitive permanent obstruction. By nature temporary, the artistic occupation of these spaces should be entrusted to the curators who are in charge of programming them. And it's signed by the president of the, profession, uh, the professional committee of art galleries. And I think it's a really good point because another thing that Coons didn't do was consult the city of Paris on where he would like to place the work. What I was gonna ask is, why would they not ask someone from France? Why ask an American? Well, that's it, and that's another thing as well. The another sort of backhand to and controversy surrounding the work is why, Him. why did they not? If they, a reason why they said if they wanted it to be in a permanent position, such as outside the Museum of Modern Art for the City of Paris, it should have been opened up to a whole load of artists mm -hmm. and ideas submitted. Yeah. However, it might have been different if it was a gift. Oh yeah, it was a gifted idea. But even so, like it, it needs to be placed somewhere with with importance and not distract 
from what the meaning of that eating. Exactly, way. exactly. So that is that is what the issue is surrounding it. So the saga continued for a good couple of years, and even without a permanent space confirmed, Coons went ahead and made the work. But it wasn't until 2018 that it was confirmed that the sculpture would be funded using private money through fundraising. And it's even said that Coons footed the bill when the work went over budget. Okay. Because it's not easy and um, not a cheap thing to make a big work like this. Yeah. Let alone install it. So it finally found its place quite near to the Arc de Triomphe. So is this a permanent feature in Paris now? So yeah, it was unveiled on the 4th of October 2019. Oh, last year? Yeah, last year. So it's been going on for a long, a time. long wow. time. And it was unveiled outside the Petit Palace in Paris and is one of the artist's largest sculptures to date. And it measures 12 metres high. And when it was unveiled, Coons was interviewed and he said that for him as a New Yorker who was living in New York at the time of the 9-11 attacks, mm. he remembers greatly that the depression that hung over the city and he just felt having experienced something as horrendous as a terrorist attack he needed and wanted to do something and this is why he gifted the sculpture to the city and now it's outside so the Petit Palace in Paris is outside an art gallery and very close to the Art de Triomphe yeah. as well. So, yes, yeah, so it was unveiled in October last year. Uh, so a very recent thing. And when it was unveiled, he also announced that 80% of the proceeds from the selling of the copyright of the work from commercial products such as like tote bags or postcards, catalogues about the work, 80% of those proceeds would go to the victims of the attacks okay. and the remaining 20% would be used for sculpture maintenance and upkeep of the work. So I think, although it caused quite a controversy, it actually, I feel it was handled very poorly in the beginning, but I actually think having um, time for it to come round and sort of for the project to, to come into realisation and now be installed... I feel that it will continue to do good. Yeah, it seems like, obviously, it might have just been something not silly because obviously it was a really serious thing it was based on. You just didn't think. Because if you think back to, obviously, he lived through 9-11 and was mm. in New York, he was just maybe taken back to his grief instantly yeah. and was just acting out of passion. Well, that's it. And I think it was a grief felt globally. I mean, we all remember where we were during 9-11 and we all remember where we were when these attacks in yeah. Paris happened I mean particularly for us with we had a sister we have a sister that lives in Paris so it was a very it was a really horrible night yeah for, for a lot of people and I feel that like you said the heart was there but it just wasn't managed well but it's very nice that he's not taking any profit from it yeah no absolutely mm -hmm. putting the money back into the sculpture yeah well. that's it I yeah. think yeah if, I completely agree from what was very poorly handled has actually it's quite nice and yeah so it was unveiled last year and this was complete news to me actually when I was like researching for a for like a controversies in the art world for this sort of for this podcast um there's quite a lot let's mm -hmm. be honest um particularly with everything going on at the moment with them um, sort of regifting or regiving pieces and collections back to places that were origin have been stolen right. um i think this is this is quite an interesting piece and not too complicated yeah a lot <laughs> of the ones we looked at was actual objects throughout time yeah but no i think no i think that's it's, it's a controversy that ended nice yeah absolutely so it's all kind of come up roses no pun intended with the or come up tulips rather <laughs> that's <pretty sweet. laughs> come up tulips okay fantastic now the final part of the podcast we're each bringing a conspiracy theory from the art world. Now, I love these. So um, if you've listened to the podcast previously and you've listened to our um, episode on the Mona Lisa, we end on a few conspiracy theories surrounding the painting. And I would highly recommend if you haven't just to go back and listen because the history of that painting is incredible and you feel that you know all there is to know. And Celia, who I interview, is just incredible in bringing all these facts 
and fantasies to life as well, which is great. So I thought in the spirit of conspiracy with the Mona Lisa, we would continue doing that now. So Nicole, you have an art world conspiracy theory for me. Yes. Um, and on part of Mona Lisa is actually about Da Vinci. Oh, there you are. So, the most... I know. Thanks, Darren Brown. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for, um, <laughs> for kicking that off. So I only discovered this because we were researching conspiracies. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I just typed in a Google conspiracies in the art world and as I was scrolling down um, it was a picture of the Last Supper so I assumed it was going to go into the you know how Mary Magdalene's actually in the painting and just kind of taking things from Da Vinci Code Mm -hmm. but and I think it's actually been proven that it's true so this maybe might not be a conspiracy this might just be a cold hard fact (laughs) (laughs) my conspiracies are true (laughs) but it started as a conspiracy, but it has now been researched, mm-hmm. I guess. So, The Last Supper. I'm just going to just gonna butt in here, Nicole, sorry to interrupt you, but for anyone that doesn't know, uh, The Last Supper is a, is a huge mural painting by Leonardo da Vinci, and it's one of his most famous works uh, with the Mona Lisa. And it was painted in the late 15th century and can be found in Milan. And it's one of the more, world's most recognisable paintings, apparently, according to the Gospel of Google. <laughs> Can I just say, Da Vinci was kind of like the bop of the artist world. Okay. Because if he did the Mona Lisa, which is the most famous painting of... Do you know what I mean? When you say paint never goes Mona Lisa. Yeah. And then The Last Supper mm. is also, thanks to Google, one of the most famous paintings. I think Da Vinci was the bop of painters. Every painting was a hit. <laughs> That was a bop. You heard it here, here, you heard it here first, people. Da Vinci makes a bop. <laughs> Moving swiftly on. So, your conspiracy theory. Speaking of music, well, you know what? Hey, actually. Actually, you made a bop. Actually, (laughs) that's a really good tie. So, Giovanni Maria Palla is a computer engineer and musician. Okay. So, he... Obviously, people have discussed that there's multiple messages and symbolism within this piece. Okay, and the most obvious, yeah. Yeah, so there's things like in the sky, there's equations, there's zodiacs, all this stuff. The list goes on. We'll be here for hours if I talk about this one thing that is very easy between it or for it. Welcome back to part 75 on the last summer. My hair's frazzled. I've got a red wire on the wall. <laughs> it all connects. Giovanni was looking at the last supper. Okay. And he noticed that within the composition of where the apostles were standing mm-hmm. and the table, it, it divided her harmonically. Okay. So the apostles are the bars. So the whole section is five bars. Right. <laughs> and see when you look at But he obviously saw something that no one else did. Because when I looked at it, when it's divided up, I'll provide you with the example of how it's divided up. And you can see it once it's there. Okay. I just kind of wish everyone at home can see my face because I'm looking at a photo of the painting now and... Going, really? <laughs> I mean, you got to give them... I think it's amazing when people can spot these Points for imagination. Continue. So, he then looked at their hands Mm -hmm. and where the bread was placed because symbolically, that's the body of Christ. Okay. So, anything within the piece that was a symbolism of Christianity, which I believe is just the bread, but anything that was in the painting would become a note. Okay. So, Giovanni compositioned this piece and he mapped it out. I mean, he says, it sounds like a requiem. It's like a soundtrack that emphasises the passion of Jesus. It's the apostles holding the bread um, that makes the composition. So I'm going to play it. Okay. This is the Last Supper. on he goes into the interview and discusses it essentially summarizing what i've said so i paused it before he starts to speak well another part is the da vinci was actually a musical genius as well as like an inventor and painter i mean it wouldn't surprise me i mean he he could literally do everything so that is my conspiracy but hearing it is essentially debunked but i'm going to say my conspiracy is he wrote bops 
He wrote Bobs. He wrote Bobs. Well, there you are. I think it's really interesting that um, someone can look at a painting and see that. I mean, it it does make sense if what what you're saying symbolism wise that the, you know, the hand and the bread, which in Christianity symbols the body of Christ, naturally can become a body of music. Mm. So just how he thought of that is is quite incredible. Um, And that also that somebody has gone off and has gone off and like looked at this and composed it. Yeah. But anyway, I would... Love to know what people at home uh, think. And like I said, we will link an image on my Instagram page and on my website as well. Because I think this is one that you really kind of have to see it to kind of wrap your head around yeah. what you're kind of coming on to. But a really, really interesting con- conspiracy theory around that piece. I mean, there's there's thousands. And again, like you said at the start, Dan Brown has been fantastic at awakening. A the- like the conspiracy theorists. Within Da Vinci. Yeah, absolutely. And the whole Knights Templar and Illuminati. And it's, don't get me wrong, like that is a rabbit hole you could spend the rest of your life going down. But I think, again, it just kind of shows you the power of art, really, because, you know, these things were used as propaganda. That it wasn't a time where, you know, the, the, you know, the printing press wasn't really a thing. It wasn't, there wasn't newspapers. There wasn't, yeah. you know, people didn't communicate in the way that we do now. Yeah. These were symbols and things that people understood because religion was really so central in their lives. Yeah, and ingrained into you, basically. So, very interesting. You're welcome. Hmm, thank you. Good conspiracy theory. Okay, mine is a bit more London-based, so we're coming back. We're coming back to London here. You wouldn't tell me... You kind of told me the theme, but you wouldn't go into details. So I'm very excited for this. Okay. This is a conspiracy theory which surrounds a British painter called Walter Richard Sicker. What has he done? So he's actually quite a famous painter and and was active between 1860 and 1942, but is known for his very sort of dramatic representations in his works and as someone who really loved sort of mixing with the underworld of society and depicting that within his paintings. However, there is an American crime novelist called Patricia Cornwall, who is convinced, convinced that Sicker was actually Jack the Ripper. So this is the conspiracy theory. Basically, she has spent a large amount of her fortune. So she writes, she's a very successful crime novelist. I personally have never heard of her, but then again, I'm not into sort of crime. Yeah. Uh, but apparently she's amassed a fortune of over a hundred million dollars. And she actually used to be a mortuary assistant. Oh, that's a cool job. As the morbid coffin. Well, that's it. And um, so this is obviously... She's seen some stuff. Anyway, so Patricia Cornwall claims to have spent well over £3 million of her own money attempting to confirm the theory and has even written two books on the subject. So in 2017, she spoke to the newspaper The Telegraph, saying... Over the past five years, I've spent thousands of hours as well as a small fortune investigating Sickler's art, memorabilia, and more importantly, other original documents, evidence and technologies to prove that he is Jack the Ripper. I've continued working with top scientists and art experts, siphoning through piles of archival materials, utilising non-destructive forensic paper analysis and special light resources. The upshot is that I've never been sure of Sickler's guilt. I believe he was responsible for the Jack the Ripper crimes and other debaucheries as well, which included dismemberment, cannibalism and murder of children. And in 2013, she came to light because she actually purchased a work of the artist called The Camden Town Murders, which the artist painted in 1908, which referred to a series of murders which happened in and around Camden. So she purchased this one painting which depicts a naked lady on the bed and um, her head is sort of turned away from the viewer and there's a gentleman at the end of the bed who has, whose head is bowed. I think I've seen this. And it's very, um, well, interesting if you have, but I'll go on to that. It's very dark. There's nothing, there's not a lot of detail sort of facially in these figures uh, just from his sort of brushstroke technique. But she came to light because... She was so convinced that this painting contained a hidden message that she destroyed it in order to find it. So she ripped apart this painting thinking that 
that Sickler had hidden a message or a confession within the work because she's just so convinced that he is Jack the Ripper. Essentially, she isn't actually the first person to accuse Sickler of this crime and he's been linked to murders before, but it's usually... He actually used to mix with a gentleman called the Duke of Clarence, who was the grandson of Queen Victoria and who had a passion for whoring in the East End and it left him with syphilis of the brain. And the Duke of Clarence is actually somebody who has also been associated with Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper. Um, but of course, this is a conspiracy theory that, that runs deep. And I think a couple of years ago, someone came out and said she was convinced that Jack the Ripper was actually a woman and yeah, not a man. I've heard that because of the trust thing. Um, which is quite interesting. Anyway, so <laughs> basically what sparked this is the artist's name came into the frame as Jack the Ripper because someone claimed that he was the child of the artist and that when the painter died, or just before the painter died in 1941, he confessed the crimes to him. But this was never confirmed and it was always believed that it was childless, which is actually why Cornwall believes that he became Jack the Ripper because he had three failed marriages, he was battling with his sexuality, he was childless, and in, 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 a, in a rage became Jack the Ripper and, con, and committed all these crimes. And she seems to think that this series of paintings that he did in 1908 around the Camden murders were really him admitting to the world that he did the murders and because and why she thinks this is because a lot of the works in this little series are actually very similar to the autopsy photographs that were taken oh. and how the bodies were found so her theory behind why he is this person is because they were so accurate in how these bodies were laid out and particularly the ones sort of, um, you know, Jack the Ripper famously, his last victim was found in her flat. Yeah. And he near enough completely recreated it, sort of position to position. So this is why she thinks that he is Jack the Ripper. However, I've got a really great quote here from Andrew Patrick of the Fine Arts Society, who apparently has purchased or, or who apparently sold Patricia Cornwell a couple of paintings. He, so he said here, quoting... If, as it is claimed, a painting was cut up, that is very wrong. Everyone knows this stuff is nonsense. He loved these dramatic titles and to play with the idea of menace. And Richard Stone, who created a large Sickler exhibition at the Royal Academy in 1992, is quoted by saying, I can't believe she's done this. It's such a red herring. It all sounds monstrously stupid to me. Is she so obsessed that she doesn't mind the destruction of a painting such by such a very fine artist and to add coincidence to this silly theory. Even if Sickler were Jack the Ripper, it would not justify doing this. It's like taking a Caravaggio apart to investigate the stabbing he was involved in. It's mad. He added, Sickler was interested in music halls, the theatrical and low life. He played around with the themes like Dega and his mentor. He always painted from photographs and he was one of the first artists to do so. And although Cornwall has failed to find any DNA on the letters held by Scotland Yard, written by the man pretending or claiming to be Ripper, to compare to the samples taken from Sickler's death letters, which she has bought at auction, she still claims that one letter had the same unusual watermark as Sickler's writing paper and believes this is justification enough to continue her cause to beat the drum that Sickler was Jack the Ripper. And she even says, if a jury had seen that then, they would have hung him. True, she was right. So there you are. Um, what do you think? For the Jack the Ripper thing, I honestly, I, there's probably like 500 people that have been connected to it. Oh my goodness, forever, forever being connected. An interesting theory that because he was aloof and didn't have any family, and but then again, it doesn't really explain why it stopped though, because all the murders happened in 1888. What I remember them saying, though, was that the murders were almost kind of surgical mm. and like done with such precision that it had to be someone higher up. Not saying that he wasn't, but, you know, a doctor. And that's why they thought it was that. Right? Yeah, because they thought, well, for a while they thought it might have been the physician to the king mm -hmm. or the and physician to Queen Victoria. And it was related to royalty because of how higher up and the knowledge and stuff like that. Mm. But, but then this is also maybe why now she's working with professionals because of how much backlash she must have got for destroying a piece mm. um, 
Yeah, because I think it's a, I think regardless if it, if it did contain the secrets of the universe behind it, like there's ways of like what did you think destroying? Like people X-ray paint. Well, that's it. That's what I would have done. Like surely she should have X-rayed it instead of like, and and maybe. I mean, maybe by destroyed it means that she's done so many tests on it. That, but it says here that the the theory is that she's completely cut up the work. But I think that's just um, someone that has money and wants to push a narrative. Because as well, if she's wrote books about it, that pushes her books. Yeah. And I'm not obviously there are you see it everywhere when someone believes in a conspiracy, they will fight it to the end of the air. Well, that's it. Absolutely. Hmm. Um. Again. Another conspiracy that I would love to know what you think at home. Um, Nicole, thank you so much for uh, coming on the podcast today again and being so wonderful and sharing with me one of your art history beefs, one of your controversies and an art history conspiracy theory. Um, Just something a little different. So before you go, where can people find you? So you can find me at ecopause underscore on Instagram and Etsy. My website is www.nicomaglocklin.com and I'm also a resale printer with Wild and Kind, which is a female collective, which I recommend checking out. Very wonderful social enterprise. And that's kind of where you can find me. Amazing. Thank okay. you for having me. No, thank you for coming back again. And I've already asked you previously, like, why is art important? So what I would like to ask you this time is... Of the six facts that we've discussed today, what is your favourite? I'll be a bit, I think the Last Supper one. I think that just because obviously you've seen the films like Da Vinci Code and stuff and it's, I was really like, oh my God, I can't believe this is a thing and then having the music to accompany it. Yeah. It's quite fun. Although I did like the Murder in the Pimp. That's yeah, kind of Caravaggio. Yeah. Yeah, it's, because his work was like so, it's just, Kind it's very iconic. It's he's hotter. Yeah, he's one of these ones where you probably don't know the artist by name, but the second you see him, you'll be like, Oh, he's that guy. Yeah. And then when you're going into the lead poisoning, is that maybe why everything was so dark and because mm. his mental state wasn't And yeah, in check. Yeah, was poisoned by lead, so he was you know, mad as a hatter. Mm. I don't know, I think mine is a toss-up between the Jeff Coons and the Jack the Ripper theory. Oh, well, that we love our own. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. True. I think I did the best. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll go with The Last Supper. Okay. I think that was... It's fun seeing it and when you can actually see the composition. It just kind of... It just is nice to see how differently everyone thinks. And how everyone can see it. Because one thing I forgot to mention was someone had said it, but then this guy had read it and he was like, is no one going to look into this? So then he decided to do it. Ah. So, sorry, I forgot to add that bit, but I'll add it now. So it's kind of interesting how someone was inspired and then debunked it. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really cool. Because a lot of Da Vinci stuff is all mathematical compositionally. You know, like the perfect ratio, things like that's always in it. You know what the perfect ratio is? Well, you will. I don't think I do. So it's this spiral. Okay. Um, oh, is this what in his like Viridian man sort of thing? Yeah. And if you place it on a lot of art, so it's broken into like squares and circles and curves, mm. but it's everything's like the perfect ratio, so it makes like the perfect composition. Okay. It's a lot in Da Vinci's work. And then a lot of artwork, like I don't know the name of it, but that Japanese painting with the wave, that's the perfect ratio. Oh, right. Okay. So when you look at a shell, um, Hoka size. The wave, the, the, the blue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So you see even something, because it appears in nature as well. Okay. So it's this kind of phenomenon that it's just this thing that we naturally respond to positively. Right, okay. So it's a lot, and hence, and like graphs and grids and, you know, inspiration for graphics. It's, oh, okay. Yeah. Hmm, interesting, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I should do stuff on that next time. It's really interesting when you kind of break down graphics and how grids and lines and stuff and how we respond to it and stuff. Mm-hmm composition like center lifts and rights interesting yeah wow. okay i'll be back at that time <laughs> okay great thank you so so much nicole no thank you for having me bye bye
And there you have it, the end of another episode of the Joe's Art History Podcast. I would just once again like to thank Nicole for coming back onto the podcast and for bringing such entertaining conspiracy theories and beefs and controversies from within the art world to discuss. Um, I hope it's really got you thinking and had a lot of fun researching and recording this particular episode. As we said in the podcast, any images that we discuss throughout the episode can, will be available to view on my Instagram page, which you can find in a link below, or you can just Google now at Joe's Art History, or you can find them on my website, which is www.joesarthistory.com. In a new addition to my sort of media outlet channel, so where you can find this information, you can also watch the podcast interview on my YouTube channel, which is Joe's Art History. On here, it's a very sort of basic video that I've put together, but whenever we discuss a work, I do insert the work through the duration of which we're talking about it. So it's perhaps if you prefer sort of listening and watching things on YouTube, it's just to sort of um, expand the reach of us as well. If you'd like to get in touch and discuss anything that you heard today, you can email me, joesarthistory at gmail.com. I would love to hear your thoughts on the episode. And if you have any conspiracy theories or art history beefs, or uh, controversies that you would like to share or would perhaps like us to cover in a different episode if you enjoyed this sort of slightly different format to what we normally do on the show. Finally, my name is Jo McLaughlin. I have been your host and your friendly art historian and I look forward to welcoming you next time on the Joe's Art History Podcast. Until then, keep learning and remember, art is for all. <laughs>